see um, what are our, some of our perceptions about these and how can we view these calculators for ourselves personally? And then if we're running a business, what kind of impact can this data have? And so to help us with this, we've got one of the most foremost experts in this space, uh, Chris Conway. Uh, Chris, uh, really charged up to have this conversation with you about a topic that we've never discussed on this platform before. Uh, however, we all we do seem to talk a lot about, hey, how am I going to live the longest and what sort of things can we do to take care of somebody who may be um, uh, uh, have disabilities and, and things of that nature. But um, but before we dive into this, let's get to know you a little bit better. What um, tell us a little bit about your background and what led to your uh, you know being a thought leader in this space. Uh, happy to do that, Steve. Thank you. We're really excited to be with you today. Um, we we appreciate the opportunity to talk about something that we live and work with every day that um, is kind of in the public discourse, but uh, is is batted around um, often inaccurately for a lot of reasons. Mass media mentions it all the time and so on. Um, I, I followed a fairly circuitous route to where I am today. I started 40 years ago in the life insurance business, which is somewhat underpinned by the concept of, of life expectancy analysis and that kind of thing. I was a terrible salesperson, however, uh, and, and, and struggled to be a better one for a very long time. After about 10 years of doing that, I was living in Lexington, Kentucky, and met somebody who asked me if I knew anything about what at that time was called the viatical settlement business. Without getting into that history, I was fascinated with the idea, um, and there was a there was a small nascent financial uh, activity taking place, but the underlying variable, the key variable there, was life expectancy. Um, and uh, the science and art of that was not particularly well developed at that time, but it didn't need to be uh, based on the impairment that was the, that was the focus of that business. 30 years later, I've been a, a, around that marketplace for that much time, always related to the life insurance business. It's a part of the life insurance industry. The underwriting activity um, was one that I interacted with for commercial reasons for a very long time. And one of my friends was an actuary and an underwriter who started a life expectancy underwriting company. Um, and sadly, he passed away unexpectedly. His business partner was also a friend and we acquired the firm, but we weren't quite sure what to do with it. We knew what it did and we knew how it worked, but I'm not an underwriter or an actuary. My business partner and I eventually relaunched that platform as ISC Services, and we now provide life expectancy underwriting services for the life settlement market, the structured settlement market, senior living and financial planning marketplaces. And we're basically bringing a technique, a technology, if you will, from a, a, a fairly small industry to broader markets where something we call longevity risk is present but it's not generally assessed on an individualized basis. That's what we do. Um, and that's why we're here. Wow. Uh, that's a fascinating uh, turn. And I remember those days of viaticals and the um, controversies around that. And right. uh, it's, it's really been kind of cool to see the life settlement market and uh, how positive that has been and just helping people um, uh, become more aware of that. In fact, one of the things that I'll drop into chat for folks is we did a discussion on, you know, the ins and outs of life settlement. And, and you, you know, Chris, I mean, I probably will botch this, but you, um, uh, for those that aren't familiar with life settlement, what it is, is basically the opportunity to sell your life. If your life insurance policy, if you're thinking about letting it lapse or expire, you have the option 
to sell it to the company that wrote it to you. But then there's a uh, an aftermarket called life settlement where you might actually get a little bit more compensation for that policy. Is that a fair? Uh, it is. It is. I mean, the the probably the 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 key thing that the vast majority of American consumers don't know is that life insurance is an asset, and it can be sold as property under the law. Uh, and it's a regulated market and so on. And again, the key variable is life expectancy and the policy type and other variables. Um, it's still a very small market. Um, it is regulated in the vast majority of states in the US as, as the insurance business is. But when you tell someone that their policy might have value as property, that's usually a light bulb that has never gone on before. Um, my personal opinion is a lot of people in the in 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 the consumer marketplace um, are are they own life insurance, but they don't really understand the underlying instrument. And the life settlement market is a is a means of monetizing that property. And interestingly, the vast majority of consumers who report the use of the proceeds use it for senior care, health care, senior living. Uh, and other expenses related to, uh, you know, how they live out the last quarter of their lives uh, and, in this country. And, you know, one of the reasons that I sort of, yeah, like I, I just pulled up is every year, 2 million people surrender their life insurance policies, and many of those would have had value to it. Even if it's just a couple of thousand bucks, it's still, you know, something as opposed to just letting it lapse. But I think right. the the situations where I've I, I I totally agree with the the premise that a lot of those funds are being used for senior living because when I hear about people utilizing life settlement, it's usually because oh geez, mom needs memory care at ten thousand dollars a month, and we've got to turn over every stone to see where we can get get assets to pay for this. And and usually that's when somebody says, "Well, have you considered the life insurance policy?" And and uh, so so this is uh, yeah, this is interesting. Okay, well, I know we kind of we'll probably go down a few rabbit holes. And folks, if you have any questions, you just type them in, and we'll address them. But the let's kind of get the um, life expectancy calculators one hundred and one. I mean, at, at the end of the day, I think. Life expectancy ca calculators, we hear government politicians, we hear everybody citing, you know, what the average age of, of life expectancy is for males and females all the time. But I guess the the root of it is these are our business tools more than they, they were create the expectancy calculators are created as business tools for for many uh businesses. Correct. Correct. And 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 in our market, and, and broadly speaking, you're exactly right. There's a lot of discussion about life expectancy, and there are a lot of tools on the internet. I think the, the I, I would say old adage, but um, it's not an old adage, that with respect to social media, for example, if you're not certain what the product is, you're the product. <laughs> uh, I heard that in a presentation yesterday at a data and analytics conference in Minneapolis about the senior living business. Um, if you're feeding information into something on the internet or elsewhere and getting a response back for which you are not charged, um, you're the product. There's a data gathering mechanism taking place there, which is fine. I think what we're dealing with is that in the vast majority of cases you're using, you're contributing to a body of population data or cohort data, what we refer to kind of cutely as macro longevity. In other words, large numbers of people all across the country within certain age groups, there might be a demographic break at gender or smoking or non-smoking. Um, for underwriting purposes, it's not legal to use ethnicity and other issues in the life insurance market, but dem demographers do these things. And the problem is that we are all unique. 
uh, and the trajectory of our lives from a health perspective uh, has some relation to and similarity with that of our parents and our peers, but it's possible for any one of us to veer into an alley that takes us on a different path from a life expectancy perspective. So what we do is we focus on micro longevity or individualized assessment of life expectancy based on health history, lifestyle factors, and other issues. But when you're out there in the world, you do hear the concept of the average life expectancy for a male in America is X. Um, I can tell you, and I think everybody kind of knows this intuitively, it can be very different in Eastern Kentucky or West Virginia than it is in Palm Beach County, Florida. And when you start to make those distinctions, um, you can go down to the zip code level um, and that's a variable. But what we do again is we look at the individual unique within the context of their own situation and we produce output that can be used very specifically for their circumstances. Life Settlements uses it for a financial transaction to buy property, life policies, but it could be used for risk assessment in a community within a particular location in the senior living market. It can be used for retirement planning purposes. There are a lot of places where this concept of longevity risk or mortality risk, what if I pass away too soon for whatever objective I have, uh, that apply. And we're simply taking what we've learned in a, our core market, which is a little niche really, and, and, and finding ways to apply it to other circumstances in other situations where it has some utility for helping people make better decisions. Okay, no, this, this is starting to make a lot of sense. I mean, I can see where, uh, it, it, for example, um, I mean, for all of us, when we are thinking about, and I don't like the word retirement, but a chapter of our life where we are not earning revenue um, mm -hmm. and hopefully we've got lots of purpose and things of that nature. But if we're in that chapter, one of our goals is it's sort of like, I've got this pile of money and, and revenue and uh, how long is this going to last based on my current situations? And I think um, most of us have probably had some kind of arbitrary um, uh, life expectancy calculator assigned to that, especially if you got a financial planner. And like my my, I'm, I'm curious. It's sort of like when I'm meeting with my financial planner and he sort of throws out, uh, "Hey, Mr. Gurney, you're going to live this long, and so here's how it looks." Is there a, a, a difference between how he's sort of figuring that out and the the platform th that you're using? There, there is, and there are a couple of reasons for it. So, for example, um, if you're if you're a financial advisor, um, a fee only planner, for example, you're paid for your time or, or or something of that nature. Perhaps you may manage assets based on a percentage of their value. Um, you know, one of the fundamental rules of behavioral economics is making sure that you understand the incentives that are having an influence on the decisions that you're making. Um, so a lot of financial planning um, uses life expectancy estimation from public sources. In the old days, we used a book called Tax Facts, which a lot of insurance agents used based on the Social Security tables which are um, extremely short with respect to life expectancy because they're population-based. The average person in this country lives X. Um, but if you're above average or if you have better access to healthcare, if you live in certain places, um, you know, your life expectancy can vary greatly from the average. Um, so you have these, these forces that are involved in those discussions. The other thing is, is in the financial planning world, for example, you don't want to understate life expectancy such that you get to the end of that period and you don't have any money left. Right. Then with you're, which to who you blame your the financial planner. Yeah. Co correct. The 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 other influence, to be fair, is that sometimes it is the case that there's generational wealth. 
And the manager that's managing it for mom and dad is going to manage it for son and daughter. And so it's not good if there's nothing left for son and daughter to have managed. It's not good for the planner's business. It's not good for son and daughter, et cetera. So there's all these forces. Um, and, and the general tools will get you, you know, in the county, maybe. But again, what we're trying to do is get closer to the zip code, ideally, right? And I don't think we'll ever get there because of the variability of human life, which is a good thing in, in, in my view. Um, we all have these different paths that we travel and, and things happen. Um, we're trying to get you know, on the street if we can, certainly in the zip code. And there are, there are things that can be done that are tied to how life insurance companies evaluate this kind of risk to issue life insurance and other forms of insurance, long-term care, health, health insurance, and so on. And we're using those techniques, which are hundreds of years old, time-tested, based on large volumes of, of data. The only problem is that most of those markets do not address the older age consumer. In other words, you can't buy life insurance when you're 80 because they won't issue it to you at that age. So when they do their calculations and you're 50, they have to guess what the next 30 years are gonna be like for you. And they use the population data that they have access to to do that. But when you get to 80, many things may have happened. And we're underwriting a population that the insurance industry, generally speaking, on the life side, not the health side, and health insurance, I'm sure you discussed that on infinitum in your conversations, but health insurance is, is less a form of insurance in, in many people's view than life insurance or property insurance because a lot of it's transfer payment systems as opposed to true leverage. But what you're dealing with is the change in that path for better or worse. So some people can be very in very poor health in their 50s, and they decide they don't want to continue on that path. And they change the trajectory of their overall lifespan by changing their behaviors, their diet, all sorts of things, their social interaction, um, and, and a variety of variables. And you can do that at any point along the path and move the path to a certain degree. And that's what we're looking at on an individualized basis when we underwrite. Um, the only other thing I would say is that I think we should define life expectancy. The classical definition of life expectancy is the average for the population that you're talking about. It's not a point in time certain estimate. It's you will live this many years. It's that the average person like you with respect to health, age, smoking status, et cetera, gender, and so on, is going to live X. And you may fall anywhere on that curve. And you need to think about how steep or flat that curve is and how you might change to another curve by changing behaviors and so on. And this is where senior living, for example, the objective is for people to live longer and better while they live longer. Um, and you can, if you know where you are, it's, a, it's far easier to make decisions about where you'd like to go than it, if you're not sure where you are, or you're so generally aware of where you are that there's no specificity related to you. And that's kind of what we're working on. It, we're, there's, a lot, there's a lot to be done, don't get me wrong, but that's our focus as, a, as an enterprise. Yeah, I get it. And it's it's pretty exciting. So like, and, and again, I don't know if you work with like senior housing providers, but what you what you're sort of stating here is, is that, hey, um, most of the life expectancy um, calculators are implemented on our lives uh, when we buy a life insurance policy in our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, mm -hmm. predictive. But imagine if somebody is moving into a senior living community at 80 to 85, which I think is about the average age in most of the right. communities, and uh, a life expectancy calculator was applied there 
for the proprietor, the people that own the community, this is good because it's sort of, it gives them the opportunity to sort of say, okay, uh, Mr. Smith has X amount in assets. He can afford to live here through his expected lifetime. But the thing that you just said that intrigues me is if that provider also uses this as a yardstick to say, we are going to extend the lives, the productive lives of our residents. Wouldn't that be kind of cool to sort of see, you know, that, you know, in five years, the people that, you know, move into this community are actually living more productive lives and we've increased their expected lifespan. Is, is that one of the concepts that you're talking about? It, it, it is. So, um, I mean, we're grateful to be here with you and your audience because we, when we first started to think about other markets, other constituencies that we might be able to serve, perhaps not with the specific product that we produce for the life settlement market, for example, but with some other form of output that's useful for them, we did some market research and we looked at the senior living world very broadly and we identify longevity risk but we don't really know a lot again yesterday i was at a conference and one of the sessions had two uh business leaders um who mentioned something that's tangentially familiar to us um and i i made a note and 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 we'll we'll want to talk to them because they gather I mean, that world gathers a tremendous amount, and the conference was about data and analytics, a tremendous amount of healthcare data, which is our raw material. Um, and they use it for treatment planning and a variety of other decision-making processes. The operators, um, and there's a lot of you know, real estate concepts associated with senior living, obviously. There's a shortage of housing and all these kinds of issues, which we're learning about. But the operators um, have an incentive to extend the lifespans of their residents, which if successful, and we certainly hope that's the case, is driven by their ability to analyze that data from a variety of perspectives and modify all kinds of things from activity schedules to dietary considerations and everything in between to do that. But if they achieve that objective, that housing stock isn't going to be available as soon as it would otherwise be, it's going to be, be available later. And the other presentation that kind of rings the bell for us was the demographer who opened the conference with a discussion about what we call the silver tsunami, but he was talking about the, the generational cohorts, the, the silent generation, the boomers, and so on. Well, the group coming after the boomers aside from not having as many kids to help take care of them, is bigger than the boomers, according to this gentleman's presentation. So this, this pressure is going to continue to exist and healthcare is going to continue to improve and funding is going to be needed. And if we're successful at like extending the length and quality of lives, knowing how that's going to change and how those things will play out on an individual community, locality, state basis is going to drive a lot of the funding decisions at the end of the day that will be necessary at federal, state, and local levels to pay for all that. Yeah. And, um, and so we're just, uh, I mean, not to minimize what we do, but we are an input variable that applies a particular perspective that comes from an industry that nobody thinks about as being related to senior living. But what life insurance companies do as an underwriting exercise is a technique that we've adapted for this purpose. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're fascinated by the prospects. And again, we're, 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 our output could in theory be another source of information used to make decisions to change both the quality and the duration of the lives that are being served in that community in that industry. This is really cool. Now, before we were, we, we logged in, you were showing me a form, like a typical sure. form, I think for a life settlement. 
and I, it dawned on me after I saw that form, it's like, man, I wish I would have uh, had you do an analysis on me uh, uh, last week, and then we could reveal the results. But I think um, if you don't mind bringing up that sample. Yeah, let me see if I can, uh, because I can recreate our experience here. Yeah, it, it's, uh, I thought it was kind of interesting. And it's something for folks. Is that, to, is so, that visible to everybody? Yeah, that, that looks okay. good. And so, okay. uh, yeah, good. So number one, describe what this is and why it's used. And then the next page, it'll show a hypothetical result of uh, what happens if, if one of us does this analysis. Correct. So this is a this is effectively a template that we use in the life settlements business to report the output of our assessment. And I'm happy to describe the, the describe the underwriting process, but this is the output that's delivered to the customer, um, which could be a consumer, an asset manager, a financial advisor, a broker. Um, uh, we would probably modify this for the consumer. This is fairly not so much technical as as probably not as specific as a consumer might want. But just as an example, this is basically input information, demo, basic demographics, the name of the insured involved, identifiers that allow us to make sure that the medical information that we ultimately are 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 using to evaluate. Uh, matches the life involved, uh, when that information begins and ends. Um, there's a period of time during which medical information is more useful than not. Having records from 10 years ago might not tell us as much as you would think about what's going on with you today. On this side of this report, you have when it was produced and you have what's called a mortality rating, which I'll explain in a second. You have this concept of mean and median, that is the average and the midpoint. And they are different things. If we all remember grade school, teacher graded on the curve, they might've reported the mean and the median. A lot of times, particularly if it was algebra, in my case, I was hoping they used the curve. <laughs> um, the type of life expectancy has to do with an interesting idea, which is that when you sell your life insurance policy in the life settlement market, the theory is, and it's true, that you as the seller know more about your health kind of intuitively, maybe not clinically, but intuitively than anybody else. So no matter how your health history presents, um, you have a sense that this is the right thing for you to be doing based on your expectation that you're going to outlive the life expectancy. And this has to do with all sorts of variables um, that are related to kind of self-reported data. Um, if the policy has already been sold, there's a tertiary market. Property can be resold, just like stocks and bonds can be traded. Life settlements can be. Then you have the actual age of the insured and whether they're a smoker or a non-smoker. Um, predominantly cigarette smoking. The next section is, J is basically a distillation of what's in your medical records that is relevant to your life expectancy assessment. So it's not everything that may have come along in your health history. It's the things that matter and that have an impact on your current life expectancy assessment. The primary and secondary impairments are the most important things. So for example, um, I heard yesterday that the typical senior living resident for one of the, the uh, persons on stage, their community has 12 impairments on average. Not all of those impairments are meaningful from a life expectancy perspective, which doesn't mean they're not meaningful. So for example, aches and pains are meaningful, but they may not be the thing that is driving whether you're gonna live longer or shorter than average. Um, we list the two primaries and then we have additionals that matter. Lifestyle, we all know matters a lot. Do you have social interaction? Do you exercise? Do you have a, a, a good diet? Are you frail or obese? These kinds of things and what's driving that. 
these are just healthcare codes. These are for billing purposes within the health insurance industry, but they each impairment, and there are hundreds of thousands of them have a code. Um, and then we have what are called functional status considerations. Can you walk? Can you dress yourself? Do you feed yourself? So on and so forth. The second page is the quantitative information. This is where the calculation is done. So one of the things that we would like everyone to understand is that the calculation is done at the end. You have to have input for a calculator to produce output. So our job is to produce correct input and assess that input. The calculation is relatively simple. And if you think about it, you know, if you put numbers into your Texas Instruments calculator, it will give you an answer. If you put the wrong numbers in, you'll get the wrong answer out. So underwriting is the exercise of determining the inputs, mortality rating, and so on. And then the calculation is based on a mortality table related to people like you, of your age, of your smoking status, of your gender, et cetera, and where on that curve, where in this body of numbers, the average and the midpoint are. And then this is just a picture of a mortality curve. Notice that it is not a perfect bell curve and that any individual with this assessment, and this is just a sample, is going to fall somewhere on this curve, it, but it is the entire curve that describes life expectancy, not this particular point or this particular point. So you have these probabilities. What if you live to the longer end of the curve? And what if you don't? And when you're planning or making decisions, you need to take into account the, the likelihood that you're somewhere in the middle, but you might not be. If mom lived to be 105 and nothing's wrong with you at 80, it, you have a higher likelihood than if mom lived to 75 and you're at 80, just based on genetics, which is a, approximately a 30% influence on life expectancy. But this is the kind of output that's used in the life settlement market. Something similar might be useful in the senior living market, both on an individual and a population basis. So in theory, we could go to an operator and underwrite the lives in that community. And they may have a very different profile than lives in another community operated by the same operator in a different place. Um, and that would tell them a lot of things. You know, is the care that they're doing in place A better than the care than place B? Why is that? Can we change that? Are there ways to share what's being learned in A with B to improve the quality of care and change the profiles of the residents they're in? And all these kinds of things. But it all starts with an individualized assessment like this. I love it. Uh, this is really interesting. And, you know, you can just imagine so many different applications of this. And I imagine the the other thing about data like this is you're talking about data, you know, having good data in to uh, generate these results is, is that um, that it's constantly being updated in terms of uh, people that are underwritten and, oh, it was, you know, yes, it was a low probability that this person was going to pass away at this age, but it happened. And that's more data for the future. Correct. And so, uh, uh, I mean, it's a very good point. We actually do underwrite the same lives periodically for some clients. So we'll see the same person. And, and, and it's not uncommon. A lot of people believe that if you have a life expectancy of X today and you get two years down the road, by definition, your life expectancy would be shorter because you're older. That's not always the case. In some cases, it's the same. And in some cases, it improves. Well, and, and that's one of the things that I was intrigued by if a senior living provider sort of utilized your data in a creative manner, or I should say different manner than it's normally used. It's sort of, you've got your base baseline 
on year one moving into our community, your life expectancy is X. We're going to do this again next year and then next year, or maybe every other year and um, begin to see some of those improvements or decline and, and begin to make real decisions on uh, what are we doing here? You know, okay. uh, how could we, how could we improve quality of life? You know, Right. And uh, you're absolutely right, Steve. What we did is we, we looked and said, there's, there's longevity risk taking place here. How can we help? And what will be the implications of that information? How can it be used? And we're still learning because again, a lot of, of, a lot of what we hear is macro, which makes sense because the population that needs to be served is gigantic. From what I understand, there's, there's a shortage of, of units that's tremendous um, and you know, so yes, build more properties. But then once those people are there, they have to be cared for. They have to be yeah. fed. Well, they, they need to be engaged and so on because it's not retirement, right? It's just another phase of life that you want to be as high quality as possible. What's interesting is today, this week, I, I did five discussions, one every day this week. We had a discussion on home sharing, which is a, a growing trend and it's a solution to affordability the lack and the challenges of building new housing and the concept that older adults come together and live together the same way that young people, uh, you know, in, in their 20s and stuff. Um, and the other discussion that we had was uh, a woman who wrote a book called uh, How to Live Forever. Uh, the, the writing the story of your last chapter and like her concept was, um, hey, how do you live forever? Well, none of us are going to live forever, but if you can improve your, the legacy that you have, and I think it's fitting that this is our last discussion of the week because yes, I think we can all agree that the macro life expectancies are, you know, they're, they're just numbers that are out there. The micro starts getting interesting because it's sort of, um, okay, I might have 15 years to live. How am I going to write my life story? What am I get? you know, it can be a motivation. It, it's uh, yep. for us uh, as well. Um, Mary asks, um, Mary asks, are demographics included in the life expectancy assessments? And I think also, you know, because we have consumers and professionals listening to this, sure. is, is that, have you ever had, like, this is not a consumer product. It's a consumer product that's usually delivered by a life insurance or a senior living provider. But uh, it, is there a consumer portal that like if somebody was just interested in a, a deeper analysis of their own life expectancy? That, well, it, it's a great question because uh, for us, we're a small company at this point. Um, and so the public calculators, right, are unmanned or unwomaned or however you want to yeah, yeah. put it. Um, they're, 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 um, it's just machinery and the underpinnings are, are stable. We can use demographic data. Um, in the life insurance industry, there are laws about anti-discriminatory effects of certain kinds of demographic data, but in our underwriting exercise, we can do it. We don't produce a consumer pro direct product at this point in time. And if we did, we'd probably end up with a, a proprietary online calculator where the inputs would be input by the, the, the patient or the insured or the consumer. What we do is we gather medical records, we distill those to their most meaningful uh, contents, and then we evaluate them relative to a proprietary underwriting manual, a set of rules, um, and we then assign mortality ratings to individuals. So could we do it? Yes. Uh, it would require a lot of people that have to be specially trained. Life insurance underwriters are not life expectancy underwriters. Again, most of them are looking at a much younger population. So we are building a team of people and we are creating a, a subculture, if you will, 
of a specialized kind of underwriter um, that has a perspective that's somewhat inverse. In the life insurance business, you filter people out. I'm sorry you don't qualify, you smoke too much. Uh, in our business, we underwrite all the way through. In other words, we look at everything to make an assessment. If that assessment is you're super healthy, that's the answer. If that assessment is you're severely impaired, that's the answer. Whereas a life insurance company would reach a level of impairment, they'd say, we have no product for this person. They don't qualify. They won't be able to afford to pay what it would cost to insure them, and they're out. We don't filter out. Um, so we do have the ability to use demographic data. Interestingly enough, a lot of healthcare data um, is filtered so that some of that is not always available to us. Hmm. Um, but that's more of a legal slash political issue than not because there are certain impairments that are unique to specific demographic groups. Um, from our perspective, gender is a scientific issue, a genetic issue, a chromosomal issue. Um, although in the life insurance industry, that is also changing as a function of social change, cultural change. But underwriters are effectively technicians. So we're looking at healthcare data as presented if we get demographic data, um, and we always want more, by the way, um, because more input is better. Um, a lot of healthcare data, for example, my own physician does not ask me but one question about my exercise habits. <laughs> um, one, do you do it this much? And, and he doesn't okay. ask what kind. He doesn't ask, you know, if I do it all in one day. It's not a criticism of him. It's a criticism it's the of the, the data collection mechanisms yeah. that are in place because he's using a laptop set up by the healthcare network of which he's a part. And, um, uh, but we try to get as much as we possibly can. And we take, um, you know, again, uh, not to disparage, you know, the, the, the state of Kentucky. It's a beautiful place. I lived in Lexington for a while. But the healthcare environment in eastern Kentucky um, is very different than in Western Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And we do try to take all of that into account. However, a lot of it might not be as meaningful as you would think. Because again, we're looking at the individual first. So a super healthy person in Ashland, Kentucky could be much healthier and have a better mortality rating than an ordinary person in Lexington, even though the, the demographics around them and the things that that we might see aren't and uh you know because you, i know we could go down this data rabbit hole and and uh but as you were talking about the mm -hmm. the flaw in the system you go in for a physical you go into your doctor do you exercise what right. but the beauty is the data that our devices are collecting now is really hopefully going to be the near future of healthcare where your doctor, you walk in and he knows how much you're exercising because yes. he was able to take the time to study your data chart. And, and now all that collected data goes into your system. And now we can begin to sort of say, you know, somebody who's exercising five days a week, we can add X percentages to their, you know, life expectancy. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. Um, let's see, Kathleen was sharing this, uh, and I'll bring it up on the, on the, the screen here, the, uh, this open data, um, for all new, whoops, uh, let's see, are you seeing that screen? I am. Yeah. Uh, she was sharing the uh, screen open data for New Yorkers. And she says for data in an urban environment, New York city makes, uh, open data available to operate the 65 government agencies available to everybody and it includes mm -hmm. 10 years of information um i'm uh what do you think of uh, a data source like this and how does does this sort of factor into different things that we can access right so these kinds of source again most of this is macro population based possibly focused, right, Manhattan, whatever. Um, and I actually live, you know, in, in the Princeton area of New Jersey. I used to commute to New York and so on. Um, 
and and it's useful as a comparative. So for example, in the life settlement market currently, inroads are being made for the ordinary consumer with a life insurance policy of say 500,000 or $250,000 in face amount. But for most of the history of that industry, it was a high net worth marketplace, very large policies, people with a lot of money, um, living in in the best zip codes, if you will, and and with access, most importantly, with access to very good healthcare and lifestyle options. As we penetrate the broader marketplace, there will be a greater degree of variability in the quality of the data. So, data sources of this size are ba- are the basis for comparison of our data sets against. For example, New York's data set. But when we're looking at an individual, if they're, you know, Upper West Side, eighth floor, 61st Street, and they're getting their health care on Park Avenue, we're looking at those medical records, where they live, how they live, et cetera, et cetera. But, and we can tell them where they might fit within that broad database. Um, And we do look at large data sets and those kinds of things uh, as a function of determining how our population differs from the general population. But again, general population data is useful. It's not what we're focused on. The demographers, actuaries use large data sets to make these broader kind of public mass media-like statements. Again, we're looking at you. And okay. the person next to you and, and and the differences in your trajectory. And I think you said it best when you mentioned baseline. We think that what we are we're 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 like is is a baseline. If you think about a credit reporting agency, for example, everybody now probably knows their credit score. But if you go to a bank for a loan, the bank has its own underwriting department too. And they use the baseline credit score as a starting point, but they still do their due diligence and they still have their own underwriting methodology for determining if if you're going to qualify for a mortgage of X. So we 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 think we may evolve in that direction uh, in a slightly different way because of our individual focus. But yes, these data sources are useful. They do not necessarily match up with the cohort, the people that we're underwriting currently. Okay, great. And um, yeah, a couple of questions regarding other calculators. What what does he think of the Living to 100 calculator? And I pulled it up. I was trying to fill it out uh, as while you were talking there. Um, but the um, and then and then Glenna is says, have you looked at the Real Age, which was initially developed by Dr. Mike Rosen and, and some of his friends? He now has the Longevity Playbook. With, which looks kind of similar. I think what with both of those, we're probably talking about, again, kind of like macro, or as you'd said earlier, like if you created a division of your company that focused on individual, you would s- still need to be refining this information for the person who is is providing it. Yeah, I I think the best way to think about it is that the underwriting activity is what we do that is unique relative to the calculator. Um, And again, it's not to say that those calculators don't have utility, but their objective is different. So, for example, um, and, and, and not to broach an overly sensitive topic, but there is an entire industry predicated on the notion for example, literally, you can live forever. I mean, there are people. Oh, the anti aging. Yeah, the anti aging community Correct. in general. Correct. And and I don't know a thing about it. What I can say is that within, in our world, there are a large number of highly credentialed academics and, and, and others who, who say that it's not really about how long, it's about how well. Right. And and what the underwriting exercise, again, will do you is give you a snapshot in the moment of where you are. And where you're likely to can to end up if you stay on the, tra- the trajectory, the path that you are on, 
And then the idea is what can you do if you want to, to change that trajectory for better or worse? Um, I think that all these calculators are, are based on, you know, you have to look at the, the research that was used to design them. And the other thing is, is that most of them, um, uh, in, in, and I'm not familiar with these specifically, although I've looked at all of them and punched my numbers in, is mm -hmm. again, you've got self-reported input. So the degree to which there's a bias in your self-reported input, and the, it's not a joke, but you know, when I used to call my grandmother who lived to be 101 and said, how's your health? She'd say it's great, but she was referring to the moment because by the end of the day, she could say it's terrible based on how she felt. Um, I think that what you have to think about also is that a lot of medical research is based on studies that are highly specified, uh, specific. So for example, SEER data, which our medical directors will use to evaluate certain cancers in our underwriting exercise, SEER data um, is usually tied to academic studies um, that are extremely rigorous, but extremely precise and specific with respect to what they're looking at and looking for. It's not that it's not useful. It's the question for us is, does that apply to the individual in front of me today? And to what degree does it apply? For example, if I use a SEER study for a cancer, but the person also has diabetes and congestive heart failure, how are those comorbidities, they're called, how are those impairments interacting with each other such that we can evaluate a mortality risk and then use our calculator. And to be honest, we are focused on the rating. That is the degree to which you are different, more or less. In other words, more impaired or less impaired than somebody that's like you in a population of, let's say, a thousand. It's the mortality rating that's really the output. You can take that rating and put it into any calculator. And the reason you'll get different answers is that the mortality tables in those calculators are different. And the tables are built based on the experience of the person who built the calculator. So social security calculators are based on the government's information and what it collects. And a lot of what it could collect, it doesn't collect for political reasons or social reasons discrimination and other issues that are relevant, but it affects the way those calculators work because they have built their tables based on the, the information that they gathered and the way they constructed them using just that information. Do they know there are other variables? Sure, but they're either not, they're choosing not to use them or they're not able to use them because it's uh, uh, not appropriate for them to do so in the context of a government agency, for example. Yeah, no, this is this is wild. You've really opened my eyes up, and I know you've opened up uh, uh, the eyes of everybody and me. Um, I, I, not by no surprise. I mean, we burned through an hour here. The um, the thing that you said, and and so I did, folks. I did complete the living to a hundred life expectancy calendar calculator. Um, I couldn't. Here, here's a very important thing. I couldn't mm -hmm. enter some of the questions it had about like my blood pressure and stuff like that because I didn't have it handy. And I just said it had an option there, but it was self-reported, totally self-reported. Says that I'll live till I'm 90, uh, okay? But the important thing is when you have an assessment done by a life insurance company, it, mm -hmm. there are things that are sort of self-reported, but all of us know you, you have that nurse come into your house taking your blood pressure, taking your blood, uh, calling I, my last insurance underwriting. They, I gave them a list of all my doctors. And one of the impacts was I was treated for a concussion and I had um, a certain prescription that came into question. And, uh, and, and so I think having those third parties in, that's what makes it micro and that's right. what makes it more customized to you. And so, you know, my hunch would be that the self-reported 90 might be modified a bit. Uh, but but more importantly, I think what you're saying is when you showed us this curve, having this arbitrary number 
is not really what we want. We want a curve to show the probabilities of um, us, you know, uh, passing away at a certain age. And then if you're periodically tested, you can see if changing your lifestyle, stopping smoking, doing things like that made right. an impact. Correct. And, and, and that's kind of the point is again, just like, just like your credit score. Once they, once, once you know what your credit score is, if you want now it to you go can up, improve it, yeah. they will tell you how to improve it and you can choose to do that or not. Um, and, and they, that, you know, again, you're the product, but, but you know what, so, I think I, you know, I really but, like the credit score analogy here because, um, if sort of saying that uh, in the average credit score is X does not mean a hill of beans, okay? Because it's your behavior and what you're doing from your financial perspective, you right. probably do fall into a range in your neighborhood and your economic status and, and, and what have you. However, yeah. it could vary wildly, but the beauty is, I think we all understand that once we have that credit score number, we want to maintain it or make it better, you know? Right. And uh, I think that's a value of life expectancy calculators. Too. Right. It, yeah. I, I mean, again, it's a metric. Um, just like, I mean, I have an Apple watch, it's charging, um, <laughs> but you know, it, it tells me things that probably influence my behavior, including when I should stand. Um, or breathe, which hopefully I'm doing on a consistent basis. <laughs> but, but, but again, I think you're right. It's it's another data point that has implications that are serious and important. And we 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 are all exposed to mortality risk and longevity risk in the in the you know the senior living world particularly. We see it in the in the business where our assessment methodologies uh, are useful. We we have a good sense of that, um, but we are we are learning, and I think what's driving all of that are demographics and data, right? So there's a lot of data out there. We just analyze it in a particular way for a specific set of purposes, and um, you know that can drive a lot of uh, decision making that's individualized. You know, you need to exercise more than two days a week and I need to eat less red meat. Yeah. Whatever those things might be. But again, without that specific information, you can get in the zone. The question is the degree to which you want to know more specifically how it relates to you as an individual. And and, and that's where we started. Um, where we end up, uh, we think is 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 a bigger theme. Um, but again, we we developed this this approach based on a financial transaction that's not widely known yet uh, that came out of a, a, a circumstance related to a healthcare event for which now there's infrastructure in place. But if you remember in the late 80s and early 90s, HIV AIDS was an epidemic for which there was no social infrastructure in place whatsoever. And, and these are demographic trends, things that drive, uh, you know, the development of new approaches to solve those problems. I love it. Uh, Chris, we're going to have you back. And um, I recorded, I'll have all of Chris's contact info so you can get in touch with him. Uh, just it'll be on proaging.com later this afternoon. And uh, this has been amazing. I really have learned a lot. And I think it, I'm really hopeful that this triggers some providers in the senior living space to take a new approach to, to looking at this data and how they could make uh, the lives of their clients and their business operations better. Steve, I really appreciate you having me on and I appreciate the gift of everyone's time today. Um, and, and, and we'd be delighted to learn, learn more about where we might fit in that world. Uh, so thank you very much. You bet. Talk to you soon. Really appreciate it. You bet. Bye.